Okay, so I think we saw some examples of historic preservation gone wrong or lack of historic preservation. So what I'd like to do now is talk a little bit about some of the victories that we're having and how we're finding a way to reuse some historic buildings. Um, and I'd like our panel, um, and I'd let me introduce them to you. In the center is Helen Higgins. Helen is the executive director of the Connecticut Trust for Historic Preservation. On the end is Frank Hegeman. He is the executive director of the Hartford Preservation Alliance. And closest to me is Deputy Commissioner Kip Bergstrom from the Department of Economic and Community Development for the state of Connecticut. I'd like to have um, the three of you respond to this. I saw a segment on preservation on CBS Sunday Morning News this past week. And Paul Goldberger, who's the architecture critic from Vanity Fair magazine, made a couple of points that I'd like to hear your responses to. The first one was, we should strive to save the best buildings from every period, but often we save something out of fear of what will replace it. He also said, great buildings move us, and of all the humanities, such as art and music, architecture is the only one that does its magic on us each and every day. Kip, would you start? Yeah, uh, a couple thoughts from that, that buildings or some buildings are works of art and are important to preserve for that reason alone, but they also carry, many of them carry important stories. I think that's what he was getting at in that second quote. And sometimes we preserve the building and lose the story, and so we end up with this em empty suit of a building. Um, we can't do that. We've really got to focus on the idea that these buildings are vessels of meaning. But they're also, it's not only that old buildings are beautiful and meaningful. They're also simply old. And when they're old and in their unrehab state, they're also often cheap. And I think sometimes we lose that notion that a certain amount of old buildings in a place is how places stay diverse. And we shouldn't rehab everything. We should let some of it stay in as is condition where it can provide a, a critical source of diversity of, of people, of retail, of commercial uses. Mm -hmm. We forget that piece of it sometimes too. Helen? Well, um, I know Paul Goldberger, and I don't want to say he's an elitist, but it, it does strike me this is sort of an elite approach to preservation, um, the best buildings. And I agree with Kip. I think that uh, our, our total building stock is really what we're interested in, because what we're interested in is having historic preservation being seen as the way to create community and to sustain community and to uh, inspire creativity in the community. And, and that's why we really need to look at a, a mix of buildings rather than just saving the one special building um, that doesn't connect us in any way. Frank? Well, I, it always is a, a surprise to me that uh, folks don't realize that good architecture often is a draw that it really draws people to, to look at things, um, and that preserving good examples of architecture should be actually a, a method in, let's talk about tourism, and specifically with Hartford. Um, the other thing that is important, I think, is that um, the whole notion of recreating a building that's vacant and abandoned somehow refocuses a whole energy. Helen spoke about community, and one of the things that we're going to be working on is the whole idea that historic uh, preservation should be the backbone of community economic development. Kip, let's talk a little bit about that, about how you create a blend um, of the old and new that has a texture to it that's appealing to people, that they want to work there, shop there, live there. Yeah, I mean, there's some folks that seem to think that there's a tension between historic preservation and economic development, and that doesn't make sense to me, because I think actually our competitive advantage as a place is that we have history, and that we have buildings that carry that history. And uh, it drives me crazy that there are folks that dismiss that and, and uh, don't understand the value of the unique historic fabric that they have, uh, you in the short term, you can't create new history. There's a, there's a fixed quantity of it. We have a lot of it. Others don't. And it's to our advantage to work from it. 
I think you can have spectacular juxtapositions of the old and the new. I don't think we have to build in a style of old architecture. You can have modern architecture next to um, old buildings and the two complement each other, but we should be very careful about taking down any of the existing historic fabric because it's so much uh, the character of our places. Um, you know, where we, where we built really terrible stuff in, the, in some of the less enlightened periods of the late 20th century, it gives us some opportunity to do better a second time. But where we built really well in the first place, I think we're crazy not to preserve it. Mm -hmm. Helen, um, you talked to me a little bit before this about um, economic development. And let's talk first about job creation that uh, historic preservation can help to generate. Well, it's, yeah, it's been documented um, in many states, including our own recently by Donovan Ripkema, who has studied the economic impacts of historic preservation for 20 or 30 years. And historic preservation projects are, are uh, uh, rehab projects are very intense on the local community. Um, and that means that materials are local and or in place. Mm -hmm. um, and also that there are more jobs per million dollars of, of investment in, a, in a, um, a historic rehab than there are in new construction. And also those jobs tend to be local jobs. So there are a number of factors of why a community actually benefits from uh, an investment in their historic resources. There's another uh, economic <clears throat> and job benefit beyond the, the jobs from the construction itself in that um, the young mobile talent that drives the innovation economy crave distinctive, walkable places with character, with history. And so if we're going to compete in the innovation economy, we need to do it by holding on to and enhancing the places we have of great character. And I, I, I would suggest that the job impact of doing that is actually several orders of magnitude greater than even the very impressive jobs from doing the rehab. Frank? Well, and further, um, what's very encouraging is preservation of buildings is now viewed as a green method. and. I think that's truly important because most folks think in terms of, well, knock down that old building and don't think of it in terms of, look, you're, uh, by not knocking down a building, you're not filling landfills. You've got, um, you, well, and certainly deconstruction is an aspect of that. But uh, again, some of the financial uh, resources that are now available look at uh, preservation as gaining a competitive edge because it is in fact part of green. And as a matter of fact, if for those of you who are familiar with LEED certification, uh, preservation now is a part of the point score if you're applying for uh, getting a nomination. Helen, tell me a little bit about how historic preservation affects property values in a community. Well, we did do a study on this also, um, and we and Donovan Ripkema did it. We looked at local historic districts, which might seem to people to be highly restrictive because there are commissions that review appropriateness to changes, um, exterior changes, and we found that the property values in those districts were higher than, you know, not by a lot, but higher than properties surrounding the district. And interesting, and this gets a little arcane for you guys, but um, local historic district property values were higher than National Register of Historic District property values. And National Register is a less restrictive uh, component. Uh, I, I think it's a really important point that people, uh, you know, people really, as Kip will say, they like what we have. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and sometimes you're trying to figure out where's the market force that wants to take away what we have, you know, when really our communities are voting for it. Mm -hmm. you know. Kip, let's talk about the whole concept of adaptive reuse, not saving a building just so that it can stand in all of its glory, but th that it can be reused for another purpose, and how you have to, as you call it, animate that building. Well, again, I, I would be careful about... Um, rehabbing everything. I, I, I think, you know, when, Jacobs, when Jacobs said, Jane Jacobs said, uh, new ideas come from old buildings, she wasn't talking about some mystical aspect of heritage architecture. She was talking about cheap space. 
and when you rehab a building, you make it into the rent equivalent of a new building, and you gotta be very careful about that. Of course, we need to do some of that because sometimes absent bringing uh, new use to the building through that kind of total rehab, rehab, the building will just deteriorate. But there are some buildings that are doing fine without rehab, and they're providing uh, the cheap space in the kind of ecosystem of a local place, and if you are so driven to kind of rehab everything, you're gonna take that dimension out of it, and what happens is the place becomes generic chic. Funky, interesting places become generic chic places because the rents get bid up and the more interesting uses can't afford to pay them, and I think we gotta be very careful not to do too much of that. Mm -hmm. I have a comment on that too. I think uh, one, of the, one of the factors that may help maintain the, the, the quality of a neighborhood and not gentrify it uh, are public subsidies for rehab, like a tax credit and so on, so that uh, basically when a, when a building, a, you know, a house here in, in um, Hartford is rehab with tax credits and so on, uh, it can be sold at that lower rate and continue to maintain the stability of the neighborhood. Well, and one of the projects that I was very much involved in was the uh, reuse of an abandoned YWCA, and it had been abandoned for 28 years. So we call it adaptive reuse, but quite frankly, what we did was we simply, developers couldn't figure out a use for this building that was individually listed on the National Register, mm -hmm. and so it sat vacant for years. However, all we did was we envisioned it going back to its original purpose, which was really very simple, humble housing, affordable housing. Uh, if you think about the YWCA historically, folks were coming off the farm, and this was a place for proper young ladies to live and have an affordable place to live where their families knew they were safe. All we did was bring financial resources to recreating that, again, for a low-income uh, population, once we completed the project, it was 100% occupied and has been ever since. Mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the secondary uh, benefits of, of historic preservation and how historic preservation sometimes has to keep going. Um, I live in Norwalk, and 20 years ago, whenever it was, when uh, South Norwalk became Sono and it was rehabbed, it was very, very exciting, and we were there all the time. And is that good enough? Is that, can you then just walk away and say, okay, we did our job, we're, we're done there, and that'll be fine, and now let's move on to another neighborhood? No. In fact, there's, a, there's an initiative underway called Norwalk 2.0 to address the fact that, you know, it's time, it's got to be uh, thought through again. Uh, you, no place stays still. Uh, the, you're constantly reinventing yourself. Um, the idea of historic preservation isn't to freeze things in time, it's to uh, preserve the best and, and as much of the places that give us character, that give us places that matter, but, uh, but also to invite new uses and invite neighboring um, new designed architecture to sit gracefully side by side with the old. I think, you know, London does this extraordinarily well. You have uh, one of the side benefits of the Blitz is that it created these holes in the fabric of London that were initially filled with, frankly, terrible architecture. And so folks don't feel bad about taking that down and putting new stuff in those holes next to the older buildings. And some of the, the, the incredible drama and dynamism of London is that contrast between the old and the new. So I, I don't think historic preservationists are, are um, locked into some um, period of design that we can't uh, see ways of combining old and new together. I think we have to do that. And, and um, renovation of a building lasts a certain time, and then it needs to be renewed or it deteriorates. Mm -hmm. It's an ongoing activity. Well, to me, um, that area of Norwalk, Sono, has been very successful. So Helen, why refresh it? Or what do we envision next for a space like that since there's so many other areas that haven't even been touched yet. Well, I, I think Kip really gets at the point that um, you have to you have to see these communities as highly organic, you know. And um, I have a, an example in my head of Bellows Falls, uh, Vermont, which um, 
uh, had, uh, I mean, what, what a dreadful place, <laughs> you know, uh, which no longer is a dreadful place. It has been reinvented and it has been preserved. But uh, to the fellow who is Robert McBride, who has been the, the chief instigator of this movement to bring arts into the community and to, and to keep the buildings and so on, you go into Bellows Falls and there are all these empty storefronts. He says, don't worry about that. There's always going to be change here. We're, we, you know, we're always going to have to reinvent it and reinvigorate and bring a new market in and so on. So I, I don't think it's, I don't think we're talking about taking buildings down in Norwalk. I think we're talking more about how to rethink how they're used. Mm -hmm. There is a national movement about sustainable communities, which I think is very important to focus on and something that we're hoping to be introducing a lot of conversation in Hartford about, and that is where you bring together the community. And in your example about Norwalk, what you do is you say, it is uh, organic, as, as Helen said, but what you do is you bring the people together who live there, and you give them the opportunity to say, what is your vision for uh, mm -hmm. Norwalk? Mm -hmm. And then what you do is you incorporate that in a plan, which then proceeds to define how you're going to develop, what kinds of things, what are good, for, what are good assets for the community. Um, and last year I visited, like Bellows Falls, I was in Decatur, Georgia, where this effort was started 15 years ago. And it has become, all of the development has focused on how do we preserve or expand this specific geographic area and make it very welcoming as a place that people want to live. Um, and all of the development has been determined, for example, height restrictions and so on, um, around how are we going to preserve this really terrific town, and in point of fact, it's been hugely successful. <laughs>